Hi class, welcome. Uh, today we're going to be going over chapter 19, The Growing Pains of Urbanization. Now, um, this chapter is going to be focusing on the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century, or the 1800s to the 1900s. And so um, this uh, time period specifically um, was a wonderful transformation uh, by going into this new industrialized uh, sort of city building life of the United States um, and all of its various challenges that we're going to be discussing. And I broke it up um, into around four sections for this chapter. So um, firstly, we're going to be discussing urbanization and its challenges, um, just general uh, sort of challenges with big cities and higher population densities and groups. Uh, second round, the African-American Great Migration. Um, from the south to the Midwest and to the north, and sort of why and how that occurred. Uh, third, relief from chaotic urban life. So urban life gets a bit complex and difficult, especially when you have high population densities and groups. Uh, and so what kind of entertainment did people actually enjoy? And so we can maybe uh, have a look into that. And then number four, changes in thought and writing. Um, having some various discussions on uh, only with a couple examples with, let's say, uh, various novels and authors uh, at the turn of the century and how they started to view the world and uh, potentially how this new urbanization landscape um, and modernization maybe influenced their work. So we can sort of get into that. But without further ado, part one, urbanization and its challenges. Um, so, as an introduction, uh, during the late 1800s, right, getting very close to the turn of the century, the U.S. was um, in full swing of being this beacon of hope, uh, being, you know, this sort of lightning rod for immigrants all around the world uh, because it was growing so quickly. Uh, population was booming, new cities were being uh, developed and built, jobs were plentiful. So the rest of the world was definitely looking at the United States during the 1800s, as I call it, the sort of golden age of United States uh, expansion, right, and growth. And uh, rightfully so. So they started coming in mass and we started to see, you know, various photographs like this, right, quintessentially with a Statue of Liberty holding up her uh, her flame, uh, welcoming people as they are sort of being funneled into Ellis Island on the East Coast. Um, and even though this sort of mantra of American life and the American dream and coming to the U.S. for right for a better life for you, your children and grandchildren was still well and alive, there were various difficulties, right? An urban life, overpopulation of cities and people just being crowded and living cl uh, closely, um, various uh, issues of assimilation, um, coming to a new country, uh, whether you are going to retain your original language and customs and cultures or inherit the American ones and sort of how that dynamic and push and pull occurs. Um, many new jobs in factory work. So although that was a huge drawing factor uh, in for a lot of these migrant groups coming to the United States, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, this was pre-child labor laws, uh, long hours. You could work 14, 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, wages were very, very competitive because economically speaking, supply and demand, as the supply of a labor goes up, the sort of pricing of their labor goes down. And so uh, owners could now use workers and have them compete against one another, right, for these jobs, hence low wages. And of course, once you have overpopulation in uh, various parts of the cities, um, poor sanitation, disease, because some of these cities were not built to house as many people as they did. And so it was sort of a catching up effect. And so at certain points, you would see um, you know, numerous individuals, a large family living in a very tight, cramped apartment, and sometimes not having indoor plumbing and just throwing out garbage and or feces into the streets. And so um, definitely some challenges, right, that came with uh, urbanization and sort of this modern expansion. But uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons for this sort of rapid industrialization that we see in the late 1800s um, is that, yes, there was new technological innovations in terms of, uh, let's say, the Bessemer process system, um, such as Andrew Carnegie used with his 
Uh, steel mills are making steel widely available. Hence, cities and skyscrapers and all these various things were now being able to be built. Factories and heavy machinery were now the, um, you know, day, uh, the, the sort of, uh, you know, new process, right, that people were um, finding work and just creating a new life for themselves. Uh, and the work was kind of centralized around this. So instead of having a old school method of, let's say, an apprenticeship of you studying under the master for 10, 15 years, and then you eventually becoming this new master of trade, let's say a blacksmith or anything else. Now we have fully now shifted and migrated towards factories being built, mass manufacturing, wage labor, um, jobs being interchangeable depending on the situation. Um, and so a huge reason for this is that in the United States and also um, abroad around the world, but the United States at this point was like the quintessential greatest example of such a thing, declining agricultural market, aggressively shifting into a rising industrial labor market. What do I mean by this? In the 1800s, most of the human population was still living in rural areas. They were still living in uh, farms and you know, that's how they made their livelihoods. Um, however, now, from the mid to late 1800s, especially now that we're getting closer to the century, this huge shift like never before, people are just bustling and migrating to the cities, looking for work, looking for opportunity, looking for better education for their kids, um, or entertainment or other various things. And so this was a very distinct shift in human population migration movements, and is something that should not be overlooked. Uh, and so even as we see people from around the world um, finding their way to the United States, uh, one of the main reasons that they're also leaving the U.S., uh, leaving the uh, homelands for the U.S., um, is because they're looking around, and if you are a farm, farm owner in the middle of, I don't know, Austria, let's say, back in the day, or Greece, or anything else, you're making a meager living for yourself, but you're reading these newspapers and pamphlets and hearing stories of America, right, and all these opportunities and new cities being built, you're already Im Im immediately envisioning in yourself that this is a land of opportunity, this is where I can make it and my children and grandchildren can find a better life for themselves. And so um, this new exciting industrial lifestyle is just pulling um, people uh, and you know migrants from across the world, attracting millions upon millions of them. And eventually we have these bustling cities um, ranging from New York to St. Louis to Chicago and others, um, where it is a wonderful sort of mishmash and mix of this vibrant life. Um, the mainstay during these days were still people. And so pedestrians were still the number one uh, commodity, not commodity necessarily, but the number one scene, um, let's say, factor in city life. People walking everywhere and bustling and walking to the local market and, uh, or, and or work or wherever they needed to go. Um, uh, beautifully seen here in this photograph, if you can tell in the center, Public transit, public transit with these cities was very, very big. Um, an excellent way to get people from point A to point B throughout the city in a you know relatively short amount of time, very economical, um, and uh, sort of combat a congestion very well. Of course, you had some horse and buggies, an occasional sort of um, maybe early, early um, automobile, um, but you know. It was definitely a uh, mix, right? And of course, you have your apartment buildings or any other type of businesses, right? Um, you kind of sprawled all over. So bustling cities, many migrants, many Americans, right? Life is just um, fully, uh, you know, alive and well. Um, and of course, you know, we still have, let's say, various representations such as this. Of the late 1800s, right, with like um, economies uh, sort of, uh, you know, still bustling. Um, and growing and shipments being made and all of these goods and manufacturing, um, you know, kind of uh, still, you know, processing whatever they need to. Um, and so the United States is definitely, uh, by the turn of the century, kind of in this huge industrial era. Um, and this will be a very common sight, men and women, and sometimes children, if you can tell in the sort of the center of the photo, the center right of the photo. Um, you know, many working side by side, long hours, um, in the factory, working for wages, doing whatever it is that they need to do. Um, these jobs were 
uh, very grueling in the sense of, and once again, this is before a lot of these labor laws started to come into effect. And so perhaps you did not get as many breaks as you wanted to, or you were working, you know, much more than eight hours a day. Uh, kids were working alongside with you. And so at this main point, if you are a new migrant family coming to the United States and money is tight, every single person in the household was working to provide for the family, not necessarily what we have today, where, you know, kids until they are 16, 17, 18, right, are kind of just at home relaxing or doing school. Um, as soon as you are eight, nine years old, boom, sell newspapers on the street, right, make some extra cash for the family because we need it. Now, um, let's go and cover some keys to success, um, as the text calls it. And indeed, they were keys to success. Um, cue in the uh, DJ Khaled uh, memes, you know, oh, this is the key to success, another one, right? Um, and so we're going to be covering four various um, sort of successful trade markers and factors of why cities and all this urbanization ended up being as successful as it was. Now, the first one mainly, and arguably the most important one, because this um, still, um, because it still reigns true today, um, is that electricity, you know, utilized and harnessed the power of nature, but modernized it in such a important aspect that it revolutionized the way that we did everything. Oh my goodness, I had a misspelling here. Thomas Edison's 1979 light bulb well no that's a hundred years off isn't it um let me just quickly uh go through and alter something real quick boom real-time changes folks heck yeah so um as we're talking about electricity uh if, if you can imagine pre-electricity pre-light bulb life People are working during the day, and so uh, productivity is limited severely. Um, candlelight is not really cutting it as far as really lighting up factories and homes and everything for true productivity, right? It is very limited amounts of light uh, and sort of very costly and expensive to keep just, you know, redoing um, candles. And so uh, Thomas Edison was not the first one who sought uh, let's say the creation of the light bulb. However, he was the first one that made it commercially viable. In this uh, video I placed here on the bottom uh, right hand side, uh, who really invented the light bulb, it details a couple of his predecessors who tried and they had early forms of a light bulb working, but very uh, expensive. Um, they're not commercially producible. They did not last too long, so they kept burning out quickly. Um, and then Edison, being the amazing uh, innovator and inventor that he was, he went through, I believe, around 6,000 different iterations of the light bulb with different materials and different wires and whatever else. And he finally settled on this sort of, um, ch uh, I believe, like charcoal bamboo wire substance that was very um, uh, flame retardant. Uh, in terms of holding an electrical current for long periods of time and not burning out. And it lasted something like 600 hours or something to that effect. Uh, and so it was definitely commercially viable. Um, and so um, all of the original currents, which initially used DC or direct current, um, in terms of these sort of electrical lines that they were using, was approximately one or two miles of distance. So even as his light bulbs, boom, became a success, they now needed, let's say, a logistical way of powering the grid, right, the electrical grid that we all know and love today. Um, and then Nikola Tesla's AC alternating current came into effect. And this truly changed the game, because now you could have long stretches of electrical uh, wire and current throughout the cities, and actually making uh, light bulbs and uh, electricity into various buildings and factories and whatever else viable, right? Because you connect it to the power plants. And so in a very short span of time, in a number of, you know, a few years, uh, we went from homes and businesses and factories being semi-lit by candlelight and productivity still remaining pretty low in the evening, largely dictated by mother nature of you know working during the day and once it gets dark you sort of have to start settling down into now evening and um 
you know, dusk begins, sunset, um, the e nighttime starts to really kick in and you flip on the switch and the entire city is illuminated. Your businesses are illuminated, your homes, your factories, especially for the, the factory owners love this because they can turn on the switches and have the day crew and then now the night crew working 24 seven, um, always having somebody in the factories to increase productivity. So truly revolutionized, truly revolutionized the entire system. So I would highly recommend to watch this video um, because it really kind of does detail um, the various breakthroughs um, that, that kind of come through. Um, and then eventually the sort of six ha 600 hour uh, light bulb that was uh, created. Fascinating stuff. My uh, sort of second C uh, key of success here would be probably communication. So um, back in the day, we either wrote mail to each other. Now we're calling it snail mail or uh, did telegraphs to each other, um, telegrams. Uh, and so communication ranged between uh, months slash weeks, depending if you're, you know, sending a letter to somebody um, or potentially, let's say days, if it's a telegram and it has to reach the office and for the person to come into the office and read the telegram, etc. cetera. Uh, but now we start to get the invention of the telephone, very practical and very quick because you can have a phone call with someone uh, over vast distances instantaneously. And so Mr. Alexander Bell, uh, although he was once again, not the first one to create early iterations of a telephone, he was the first one to create a viable, usable telephone for the masses. Uh, and so, you know, also with all of his experimentation, his innovation, um, his final product was pretty darn viable and he ended up patenting it. Now, within 20 years of all of these inventions kind of being laid down, Western Union eventually controlled 80% of all of these sort of lines, um, putting down hundreds of thousands of miles, right, of these sort of um, communication lines throughout the East and spreading into the Midwest um, and a little bit into the Western territories as well as uh, westward expansion continued and cities are being built in the West. Uh, and this completely changed the game, folks, as you could imagine, right? This is probably as large of a shift in communication. Uh, probably a modern analogy would be uh, back in the day when we only had like these older uh, flip phones, right? Um, and texting used to be, you know, you pressing one button three, four, five times until you get the correct character and texting was just atrocious and very slow. Um, probably the modern equivalent would be once we finally got touchscreen phones and then texting became the new mode of communication for us, right? Instead of a long phone call, you just quickly just type something up and send it. Probably very similar in terms of the change of communication and the quickness and effectiveness of it. Um, and so later on, interestingly enough, um, one of Edison's ideas sort of counteracted with some of Bell's ideas, but they didn't want to get into a long litigation and lawsuit over it. Um, and so the Bell company sort of um, merged with um, Edison's idea and bought them out. Uh, the Bell company eventually converting itself into the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, or as we know it today, AT&T. Good old AT&T, although I am still a Verizon fanboy, so um, I still remember all of the old commercials. Can you hear me now? Good. Um, and so Verizon for the win. But yes, Bell and his telephone inventions uh, completely and utterly revolutionized uh, the world um, that we know it. And of course, we can make modern parallels and connections to texting and other various social media platforms that we have today. Um, and yeah, so, you know, various kind of early iteration forms, right, of the telephone were sort of being made by others, but not as commercially viable as Bell's for sure, because this is just a nice, tiny, um, very accessible uh, telephone that people can use, right? And you can mass produce, very comfortable, very convenient to talk to. And, you know, people were buying this in their businesses, throughout the cities, even in their homes, right? Even if you're stretched out far into having like a farm or a homestead into the country, um, as long as the company was able to lay down a few um, sort of telephone lines and telegraph lines uh, throughout the uh, ruralness, um, you can have it in your farm, right? So very, very important. Um, the third aspect, transportation. Um, as the cities are getting larger, um, this becomes a very big logistical issue of as population density increases in these large cities, 
how do you have these large groups of people moving across the city? They can't all just walk or have horses and buggies because that'll be too much congestion. Uh, and so the perfect way and a very efficient mode in, uh, of transportation for them is to have a good public transit system. And in the early days here, now that once again, electricity was born and utilized very quickly, they made the electric uh, trolleys, right? These um, large uh, trolleys that were powered by electricity and having and housing probably anywhere from 20 to 40, 50 people, depending on the size of the trolleys and, and what city we're talking about, um, and just consistently kind of moving it along through the city. Um, and so it became very convenient because a lot of the electrical lines were being built sort of on top of the trolleys and on top of the uh, cities. So as you're walking, you might, you know, find and see some of the electrical lines above you. But you know, that's not that big of a deal. And the center of the road would be specific um, for these trolleys kind of moving forward, making it a very dynamic, very mixed um, type of road, not like we see today in uh, California and Los Angeles and the US in general, where most of the roads are just for cars versus here trolleys would be specifically in the center of the road and everyone knew that so arguably an effective um let's say parallel to the modern day um i suppose logistical issue of overpopulation and crowding and cars and traffic especially here in los angeles would be to restructure our cities and greatly improve mass transit such as trolleys and other things um, and so these could be run all day and night, once again, just dependent on the electrical grid. Uh, and, you know, cities were slowly kind of uh, learning and converting all of these things. So this is what I mean when I say the electric trolley, right? Has a little nice bell to it. So just, you know, to let people know that they're coming. But on top there, they're connected to the wire lines. And so a very nice, fast, convenient way of transportation. So I am definitely a huge proponent of them coming back because, you know, it was public transit and you could just quickly hop on, go a couple or a few blocks to wherever you needed to go and then boom, hop off, right? If you needed to visit the local butcher, the local uh, grocery store, right? Or go get to work or whatever it is you needed to do. Very convenient, very safe, open air. Um, and so definitely helped with congestion mightily. Um, for those of you, just get a nice swig of water there. For those of you who are gamers, potentially, uh, Red Dead Redemption here has a wonderful um, sort of video somebody made uh, in game. Um, this is, I believe, in uh, Saint Denis or something similar. Um, and so they're kind of go showing this demonstration of the, the uh, trolley car, right? And if you can, if I can just go back here, so you can see the little sort of cable lines, right, kind of being attached and utilized for the electrical grid. Um, and you know, folks are just sitting, sitting down, kind of enjoying their evening. Um, you can tell that then, you know, everything is lit up at night, right, with all the electrical um, grid and obviously the light bulbs etc and so you know this game does a nice decent way of kind of showcasing the mixed um, lifestyle here we have various horse and buggies going through um, occasionally right the act um, obviously the trolley here with its uh, electrical lines um, so a very nice diverse kind of uh, way of building cities so hopefully we can learn something from this but i just wanted to show this video game sort of uh, comparison because it's really cool to just see it you know, kind of extrapolated and shown in video, kind of you going through these modern-esque cities. Gives it a little bit more of a uh, personal touch flavor than, uh, let's say, just viewing photographs, right, at the end of the day. So I um, thought that would be a nice, decent touch. And our last ones for the keys of success would probably be skyscrapers. Um, because once again, huge populations in the cities, you cannot just have tiny little houses and just build, you know, and expand across the horizon more and more and more. Uh, although arguably, that's what Los Angeles has done um, over the last few decades. And that has not really worked out great for us because now we have wonderful 40 minute hour, hour and a half commutes to wherever we need to go. Um, and so, you know, that causes a whole host of other issues. But I digress. Uh, skyscra skyscrapers began to skyrocket, pun intended, haha, -ha, bada boom, tsh, 
um, cities needed to come up with a good way of housing so many individuals, right? Because obviously the population was exploding. Um, thanks to Andrew Carnegie and the heavy utilization of steel um, during this time, because he was one of the famous robber barons, one of the famous uh, factory owners, just pumping out steel like nobody's business. Um, steel became so widely available and steel was amazing because it was strong it was durable it was flexible uh and so now you could actually build up right you could build up into a 5 10 20 30 story building um, and it would hold up right and it would be strong and rigid and have all the flexibility needed um to maintain itself uh and so now that let's say real estate started becoming more and more precious as population is growing um let's say using New York City as an example, you now have to build up, right? Hence skyscrapers, more room. Now, the wealthier neighborhoods would um, also install electric elevators in there, right? So if you ever see some old school movie, you would have a doorman or there or a elevator bus boy or something of type, right? So you would walk in and, you know, they'd be dressed very nicely and they would say, what floor, sir? Right. And you say the seventh floor and they would kind of move the lever to whatever floor needs be needs to be, uh, you know, uh, met to. Uh, and then you'd be transported there. Um, and so uh, slightly more downtrodden neighborhoods that were sort of built up a little bit. Um, they did not necessarily have, uh, you know, as much electrical grid connected to the building to have electric elevators. And plus, you have to install the elevator itself, which sometimes would be um, a challenge. So it would be a mixed bag. Sometimes they would have these sort of small, shady elevators uh, put in. Sometimes they didn't even have any. So you'd have to just walk up. So great cardio, right? Um, so it really just depends. But these skyscrapers were being built all around the cities, right, building up and up. Um, and so life as we know it even today, right, sort of started from this trend. And I like this little photo on the left hand side. Um, the workers having a little bit of sort of lunch um, overlooking the city. Um, hopefully one of them doesn't uh, accidentally slip and fall because that would be utter uh, catastrophe. But we have these large, uh, larger buildings, right, just um, barreling upwards. And so as you can imagine, all of the new apartments that can be made really allowed for the uh, booming population to actually live somewhere. Um, you do not have to build uh, as many houses in the far out reaches of the city, which would take people so much longer to get to work. Um, and so this was a great solution, a great compromise. And here kind of showing the different dynamics um, of elevators. So on the left hand side, we have a more fancy, a more bougie um, looking elevator in one of the um, uh, buildings, right? Kind of uh, having, you know, a more sort of posh to it, right? Uh, more elegance to it. On the right hand side, having a little bit more of a dingy, but yet still functional. Um, elevator, right, in a various kind of uh, downtrodden building. So depending on the city you live in, yes, sometimes you could have availability of both, um, but just depends on quality, right? Um, some challenges as urban life started to progress. So we do have various um, books, novels, photographs, and other things written about, let's say, the other half, right, or the downtrodden or the poor of the city, because um, as you might imagine, as the city's population keeps increasing and exploding over time, congestion, pollution, crime, disease, all of these various things are also going to increase, um, especially when you have very high density population centers and you throw poverty into the mix. Um, and so we started to see these sort of uh, slum like communities, right, form or various parts of the city that for sure you should not walk alone in the dark in, right? Uh, on top of that, people, whenever they live very close together in close proximity, and of course you are coughing and sneezing on top of each other on a daily basis, disease starts to spread. Typhoid, cholera, yellow fever, and others, um, tuberculosis as well, uh, killing tens of thousands. And unfortunately, this is before a lot of these sort of great early 1900 um, medical advancements have been made, and so death could literally be on your doorstep. Um, and as we started to get these challenges in urban life, and people started to also see how the downtrodden are living in these cramped communities, um, 
the sort of resurgence of Christian or Christendom, I should say, uh, and the resurgence of, uh, I suppose, the tail end of the Second Great Awakening in America, right? This religious revival of going back to our uh, fundamental religious Christian roots, right? Um, they started to look at all these people and said, my God, uh, we should definitely be concerned about this because, you know, we, number one, we need to take care of our fellow Americans. Number two, this is not a godly Christian thing to just allow these slums to form. So hence, this sort of social gospel started to be um, discussed about, right, in various religious circles, especially um, the religious wealthy. So if you are a wealthy individual, uh, a wealthy patron, but you also have the side of God, right, on your mind, um, you are donating to orphanages, you are donating to soup kitchens, you are donating to uh, temporary houses for the downtrodden, right, to really kind of try to clean up the city and help uh, improve their lives in society. And so photographs such as this, right, encapsulate the norm in some of these communities. Children, um, not ha they're homeless, they're orphans, not having a uh, home to sleep in. And so they are sleeping uh, next to this gutter because um, this gutter is sort of the uh, tail end of one of the factories, right? And has a little bit of steam, um, you know, and warmth coming out of it. God knows what chemicals those boys are inhaling uh, throughout the night, but at least there's a little bit of warmth. Um, and so they're huddled together. So imagine seeing this and you are a wealthy Christian living in the city. Um, your heart will break and you definitely want to do something about it to hopefully improve their lives and give them better opportunities. So, um, and this sort of, uh, these two images kind of encapsulate the uh, sort of very cramped nature that some of these uh, apartments, right, would be in. Uh, on the photo on the left-hand side, the bed frame alone. <laughs> the bed frame alone took up so much space. Um, these apartments sometimes would be so small, so cramped. People, like I said, living on top of each other, not having any space or room to breathe. Um, things were definitely a little bit cramped. So perhaps a more minimalistic approach would have been best utilized here. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And of course, other sort of communities kind of struggling. Um, not even having uh, access to the apartment buildings themselves, but between the apartment buildings, building these sort of temporary like wooden shacks, right? But at least they're in the city. At least they can walk to work. Um, they can find a place um, at the local sort of um, gym or spa or community center to get a shower, right? Um, or even shower at the river at the worst uh, case scenario. Um, and so as long as you're in the city, right? For that opportunity, for that American dream. This is a great um, video I found um, uh, from Nat Geo, um, sort of explaining disease uh, explosions uh, in high density population areas throughout history and especially in the United States and during this time period that we're talking about. So I would definitely recommend kind of uh, looking into it because it goes through um, a very good number of um, points. Um, and it's definitely right in the alley for the decades that we are talking about. So definitely give this a watch when you have some free time. Um, and speaking on to, or kind of uh, progressing the conversation of disease, uh, tuberculosis uh, was a terrible, terrible disease also spreading throughout um, this time. Um, the late 1800s, early 1900s, the turn of the century, TB, even today, TB is still a very important thing for people to get tested in. Um, it's still a very infectious uh, killer around the world even today. And so, you know, the World Health Organization, uh, or WHO for short, is still trying to combat it as best as they can. But essentially, it attacks the lungs aggressively um, to the point where you start to cough up blood and your um, various, you know, uh, lung cells start to deteriorate and burst, right? Hence the blood coming out of your mouth. Uh, and so just another one of the many misfortunes of this time period and congestion and disease. And then, um, so this video on the left-hand side is a TED Talk. So I would recommend um, kind of going through it. 
uh, and you know viewing the sort of exact sort of specifics of TB and the dangers that it poses. On the right hand side, once again, apologies for the Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, situations. Uh, sorry, spoiler alert, but um, this is sort of a great little encapsulation of perhaps what it feels like to get into a coughing fit um, with TB um, and being sent and rushed to the doctor. So once again, for all you gamers out there, if you're interested, a nice little clip and segue. Um, and so, yeah, just to kind of um, go through that. And now we enter into part two, the African-American Great Migration and new European immigration as well. So the Great Migration, what was the Great Migration? Who did it encapsulate? And why did it happen? So the Great Migration occurred with African-American populations moving from the South into the Northeast and Upper Midwest. And the, the this was in vast quantities. We're talking in the couple of million, right, um, as the decades went on. So the Great Migration was definitely a huge shift in African-American population uh, and completely changed demographics throughout these new cities being built. Uh, and there's various things called push and pull factors, right? And this is not only unique for this particular topic, but for all migration topics, right? Moving across the uh, spectrum. So whenever you have an individual around the world that needs or wants to move somewhere, there are typically push and pull factors. Now, the pushing factors are the reasons why you are leaving your homeland, that could be because of famine, starvation, disease, military intervention, war, whatever. The reason you want or need to leave your homeland. The pull effects or the pull factors are whatever the new land you are searching for, right? Um, it has pulling factors. It is pulling you to there, right? Whether it's new job opportunities, safety, um, or you know, what, whatever else, uh, new factories being built, right? New opportunities uh, or, you know, uh, cheap housing, whatever it might be. And so for the African-American populations in the South at the turn of the century, many push and pull factors. Now, um, they're still obviously dealing with a heavy amount of racism in the South. The Ku Klux Klan was still terrorizing folks here and there. Um, and although it was not as prevalent at the turn of the century as in previous uh, decades, because the federal government sort of stamped out a lot of the Ku Klux Klan members um, and either arrested them or disbanded them, um, it was still kind of sifting through the South quite a bit. And so we have numerous instances of violence and or lynching still um, sprawling throughout the South. So, you know, eventually enough is enough. You're going to leave. Um, obviously, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution allowed for um, African Americans to ha have, you know, more or less legal fresh starts, right, in other parts of the country. And so they essentially just said, you know what, enough's enough. We are leaving the South in search for these new great big cities that we hear about that are being built. And so they have a mass migration movement. And so as they are entering into these large cities, they are, number one, changing the demographics of the city um, in a very short span of time which immediately, no matter if, whether you are black, Hispanic, white, Eastern European, whatever, when you are starting to come to a country or a new city en masse in a very short period of time, the, the homegrown population is going to start having some nativist or reactionist um, you know, th uh, thoughts about you, right? And so we start to get conflict between, let's say, um, uh, the black community and the various other communities already settled in these cities. Um, second, uh, a lot of these folks were moving uh, into these uh, new cities, you know, not having doctoral degrees or anything. But, you know, in this day and age, not many are having that anyways. So that doesn't really matter. Um, but the main reason they're leaving because these cities are newly built and there is a lot of work, a lot of opportunity, a lot of, a lot of factory jobs available. And so they're getting jobs in steel mills, mines, construction, and sometimes, you know, called, quote unquote, menial jobs, right? 
working as janitors, working as laborers, gardeners, whatever it takes, right? Some type of service interest industries. Um, but that is normal throughout um, a lot of the demographics that we see. Um, also, in terms of, let's say, uh, let's say if we're looking at Chicago, for example, or Detroit, uh, a lot of, let's say, very similar lifestyles here would be with the Hispanics, right? Or some uh, smaller growing Asian communities, or eventually the Eastern Europeans and the Poles coming through. Um, and so they probably had a very similar experience, right, all the way throughout um, with a lot of them. And so to a certain extent, um, a lot of people in this day and age were sort of making it um, and unified in the collectiveness of we're in this together, we're all suffering together, and lo let's try to make the best of it. But we have, you know, various examples of beautiful families such as this moving from the South into other areas, right, of the United States in search for a better life. Because even though life there was also difficult and you had to make it and work hard and put in the hours, at least it's not going to be as racist as the South was back in the day for sure. Um, and so we had a bunch of sort of migration movements um, and, you know, completely changed demographics throughout the United States, for sure. Here's a, a little bit of a clip and tidbit um, from the History Channel by uh, one of the historians. And so definitely uh, worth um, a, a little watch. So it's, it's just under two minutes and it kind of details the Great Migration a little bit more. So in your spare time, please kind of review that. That would be um, for your benefit. Um, the one amount of continued discrimination um, that the black community still faced even after leaving the south and they went into all of these new cities uh, was not it was obviously better than the south right you're not dealing with lynchings as nearly as much or at or, or at all as the south right and so let's say you're you move from the south to chicago detroit st louis right all, all these other type of cities new york there was a different type of discrimination that started, right? Because with these higher amount of, uh, of migrants and these higher volume of new peoples, um, including not just blacks, uh, the black community, but let's say Hispanic groups, Asian groups, uh, now continued also with, let's say, uh, Eastern Europeans and others, with all of these newcomers, whoever they would be. The main type of discrimination here, because this chapter dealing is dealing with urbanization population growth city building and development um real estate right real estate and zoning and redlining that becomes a very big pernicious uh issue and that is where they get started to discriminate so we have various um various maps and charts back in the day of let's say the entire city is you know sectioned off in various grids right in various kind of zones we have various zones shaded green that will be a good zone that will be white collar jobs mostly white population there a safe community housing prices shoot up we would have let's say yellow or blue zones they're a bit of a mixed right um, some mix with white collar some with working collar etc um, different mix of population groups and whatnot. The lower tier of the zones, um, let's say, would start to d dive more into the working class. But then you had, and this is where the term redlining comes in, the red zones. They'd be entire large zones kind of shaded in red. Uh, and it was done so because it had, for multiple factors, but um, uneducated uh, workforces, a lot of folks who did not speak English, uh, Eastern Europeans slash Hispanics, Latinos, well, not Latinos at this point, but um, I'd say Hispanics and a lot of, as they called it, Negroes, right? And so they saw fit to only kind of place, you know, all of these newcomers as best as they could into these neighborhoods. And so even let's say if an African-American family was moving to one of these newer cities and they had the money and they had the qualification to qualify for a housing loan in a better neighborhood, they would deny them those loans on purpose and just give them the loans in the red line district, right? And so this is a very pernicious um, discriminatory practice, right, within the sort of real estate city level 
um, that an average person just would not really know about, right? And so you go to the city and they're like, oh, sorry, you don't qualify for this and this loan, but we can find you a loan here, right? And for you to move into this great new neighborhood. And you're like, okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. And you go into this new neighborhood and it's sort of, you can just tell, it's a little worse off. Um, the demographics are either all black or mixed with black, uh, li- uh, with a Hispanic um, and with, let's say, random white Europeans who don't speak English, right? Um, and so, you know, kind of the more quote unquote undesirable area, right? Uh, and so that being said, right, with redlining and this discriminatory practice of real estate, still better opportunities here than living in the South. Personally, you know, if I was in their shoes, um, I would also consider myself lucky just to be in this uh, situation uh, because, you know, silver lining, right? Um, I would much rather deal with some redlining BS in Chicago but have a nice factory job and my brothers and sisters are getting nice jobs everywhere and we have better opportunities for school and education and other such things versus me back in the south having to deal with all of that worse bs um and so it's all relative right um this is a uh great npr video that i found on redlining um it it details some of the early uh, redlining practices from our time period, but it mostly kind of dives into the 60s, 70s, 80s of America. But it does a fantastic job of kind of detailing it and giving maps uh, representations, right? Such as such as this. This is what I was talking about earlier when I mean how they would exactly color these um, various districts, right? And give them very um, different color codings dependent on all of those other numerous factors. So it still holds up even though they're talking about different decades. So just in case you wanted to learn a little bit more about what is redlining and how it deals with housing and loans and mortgages and all of that, great little um, video for you to watch. It's at six minutes. Now, European immigration experiences. Now, we have um, these uh, various experiences extrapolated across all peoples, right? And so... Here, the Europeans are a great example, right, of the newcomers, right, and what they had to deal with with urbanization. So even though these folks, right, um, were living in the quote unquote privileged Europe, right, as a a lot of sociologists and historians would like to say, um, in the 1800s, a lot of parts of Europe was still kind of a little bit uh, dingy, right? Uh, you know, Greece was not doing too well. Eastern European countries were still a little bit on the poorer block. Uh, Russia was, you know, uh, kind of dealing with its upheavals as well of uh, other Slavic countries. And so at the turn of the century, we start to really see an increase of, uh, let's say, Poles, Greeks, Russians, other uh, kind of uh, Slavic like Serbians, etc., coming to the United States um, a great amount. Uh, and they also had their push and pull factors, right? Their pushing factors, the reasons they were leaving their homelands could be famine, uh, lack of food, religious persecution. So we got a lot of Jewish uh, migration from Russia and Eastern Europe as well because of the pogroms and because of the religious persecution they received there as well, um, eventually leading to the Jewish American communities we know now. Um, avoiding military service, that's a big one. Um, I know especially a lot of folks in my uh, my classes that happen to be of, let's say, Middle Eastern or Armenian or uh, even some Asian countries, some descent, uh, you know, some of your family members or cousins or whatnot might have moved to the U.S. or wanted to move to the United States even modernly to avoid compulsory military service, right? I know a lot of people want to sort of dodge that. Uh, and some pull, pack, uh, pull factors, all the ones that we've been talking about so far, um, these new cities being built and having consistent wage earning uh, potential and building a better life for you and your kids in America, right? That's sort of the American Dream 101. Um, however, interesting to note, even though these were white individuals, they looked very white and pasty and skinned, right? They are not these sort of quote unquote my, um, excuse me, quote unquote uh, minorities, right? Um, as CNN and uh, the Democratic Party of today wants uh, to push down our throats, uh, you know, they were light skin, but even them coming into these new cities of America, they're treated no differently than any other 
quote unquote, dirty immigrants coming into the States. They spoke very little English, sometimes had little to no education, um, and they were just cheap labor. They're like working in the factories and doing whatever menial jobs they could. But working hard and putting their kids um, into school. So eventually, right, these communities start to form. Um, eventually, you know, the Italian, Chinese, Russian, or whatever else communities right, start to form throughout these various cities. Uh, and folks start to really help each other. Um, if you are part of the same sort of ethnic group or identity, they start to help each other with school, work, businesses, what uh, translation of legal documents, whatever it is that they need. Uh, but the homegrown population still sees all of these others, right? Very similar to today. This has never changed in U.S. history ever. They see there's a large rise in immigration and say, oh, these dirty immigrants are uh, coming in and stealing our jobs, right? And they're changing our neighborhoods. They're not Americans, right? Wait 20, 30, 40 years. And eventually the Italians who are the dirty immigrants become quintessential Americans, right? Eventually the Irish who were unwanted become the Americans, right? It just, I suppose, is the American um, legacy of always having uh, to put people through their paces, of always, you know, it's like, is it your turn in line for persecution for being an immigrant? And then you sort of go through that and you're like, okay, well, now I'm accepted as an American, right? So it just depends. Um, here we have, um, oh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Polish, yes. Here we have a group of uh, Poles um, uh, visiting the United States, right? Migrating here with uh, name tags, right? And their identifications, right? Around their necks. Here we have um, a Jewish, uh, Jewish sort of community um, holding sort of like a, not a protest, but like a little bit of a rally, I suppose, with the American flag in one hand, um, you know, Hebrew written across her chest. And the, uh, the girl on the right hand side says, abolish child slavery. Um, so this is a um, sort of protest against uh, child uh, slave, not slavery, but uh, a lack of child labor laws in factories, because you could see eight, nine year olds working on the factory floor for hours on end. Um, and so they really wanted to kind of abolish um, child slavery there. And so um, great small communities being formed all throughout. Um, this is a great uh, sort of cartoon. So Puck um, used to be a, a major sort of cartoon, political cartoon, uh, you know, business company magazine, if you will. Uh, and so I, I, I love going through their work. Sometimes it's so just graphic and vivid. And here Uncle Sam and Lady Liberty are sort of kind of, you know, sconching their heads and they're like, oh, oh my goodness, how many of these immigrants are here, right? And then everyone here is represented living pretty shoddily, um, you know, from anywhere in the world. Uh, whether it's Italians, China, uh, Chinese, Irishmen, Englishmen, Germans, Russians up top, right? Um, uh, Negroes, wherever they hailed from, whether African American or from Africa, Spaniards, Japanese, Frenchmen, like everyone here is portrayed as more or less equal, all struggling, all trying to just make it by. Um, and everyone is kind of just, you know, I, I guess the Irishman was the loudest and angriest one. He's like, get out of here. <laughs> um, and of course, you have a little sort of, um, I suppose, uh, racist stereotypes, right, kind of shown throughout. Um, so if you see, uh, let's say, uh, in the little Chinese box, right, the Chinaman has his braid and he has this like opium pipe. Um, you know, the uh, Irishman has his uh, sort of gin or whatever he's drinking there, right, kind of portraying him being like a, a, um, a drunken Irishman. Um, and so, yeah, various, various things kind of throughout these uh, cartoons, which is just uh, speaks volumes. Part three, relief from chaotic urban life. So uh, let's talk about machine politics a little bit, shall we? So machine politics, what was it? As you can imagine, if you were one of these ethnic groups coming to the U.S., migrating here into these large cities, you might be absolutely lost. What do I do? Where do I move? Um, what 
where am I going to find work? Where are my kids going to go to school, right? You have no idea. You're, you're coming in fresh, right? You have no family, no friends here yet. Um, and so machine politics was born because some of these uh, politicians became like mafia mob bosses, right, of the city. And to their credit, I mean, it's a very mixed bag. To their credit, they helped these people in, immensely, right, to get on their feet. But they asked for favors in return. So, for example, Boss William uh, Tweed, a very famous um, sort of machine politics boss of uh, New York City, uh, was a sort of this messiah figure, right? Immigrants would come to the city. He made sure to get them jobs. He made sure their kids go to the right schools. He made sure that their legal documents would be translated. Like he helped these folks out like nicely, right? He was a, a caretaker. Uh, and But he asked, he's like, in return, you vote for me and you vote only for me, right? And you vote the way I ask you to vote. And so those, this was a mutually beneficial uh, situation. Um, but because people were voting the way that he wanted them to vote in terms of even with building projects, right? Let's say he proposed a new bridge be built and he asks his legion of loyal followers, which are loyal for good reasons, vote for the bridge. I want it done. They all unanimously vote for it. The city passes it, etc. So he started to steal and siphon off money from every single one of these projects. It's estimated that by the time he was caught, he stole anywhere from 45 to 200 million dollars. A ridiculous sum, um, but eventually he was caught, charged, and died in prison with corruption charges. Um, and so the ultimate, I suppose, legacy of Tweed and other such bosses with this type of machine politics uh, would be, were they good guys? Were they bad guys? You know, you decide. Um, but the undeniable truth of it is they definitely did help a lot of these folks coming into these new large cities um, when they did not have, you know, a lot of other people. Um, and this is a great video kind of detailing um, the story of Bas Tweed, right? Um, and so his sort of a rise um, to political prominence and him being the sort of favorable uh, mob guy, I suppose. Uh, a couple of political cartoons here and there um, kind of detailing uh, him. So on the left hand side here, right, he's a sort of this big, fat, powerful, enigmatic guy. Um, standing next to, uh, leaning his shoulder on the ballot, right? Because obviously he's trying to coerce people to um, vote for him. Uh, the uh, the counting, uh, in counting there is strength, right? Saying, is, you know, your vote matters. Um, or him being represented on the right-hand side as a sort of large money bags type of guy. Um, and this is a funny one because this is like a stampede. Um, of Boss Tweed and his machine politics, right? Of his loyal supporters. So if you've ever seen something like the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Spanish running with the bulls, right? Um, where they kind of release the bulls and people are like running through the streets, right? Crazy for their lives because the bulls are like running, uh, running behind them and you'll get stampeded over. Um, this is <laughs> sort of similar. Like the machine politics was this unstoppable wave of voting, right? <laughs> kind of just uh, um, coming through the city. And of course, a cute, cute little doggy on the bottom right hand side because, you know, everyone likes little fluffers once in a while. But um, as these cities grew large and in charge, and we had so many folks throughout the cities, life was not only about work, 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 16 hours a day, and then you go to sleep and then you die. That was not the end all be all. You needed some entertainment, right, to keep you stable mentally. And so how did people uh, find entertainment in their spare time? Because this is the day and age before Netflix. So you cannot go home, put your feet up, watch a Netflix and binge a show for 12 hours and think to yourself, dear God, I have to wake up in two hours. What did I just do to myself? But I digress. Um, they had various fair, uh, forms of entertainment here, right? They had amusement parks, animal attractions like zoos and stuff, uh, wild rides. They had freak shows, right? Kind of going to see a freak show with... Uh, let's say, 
uh, the be- you know the famous like bearded lady, right? Or the Wolverine man because you know they were just hairy from like head to toe because they had some like genetic anomaly, right? Um, or you know some lady who's like ambidextrous and can do like some crazy stuff with right her like you know limbs or whatever, right? Um, or even let's say strong men would be part of this uh, type of show, right? They could just lift crazy heavy weights and do all of these demonstrations and stuff, um, you know. And sometimes. They will have stuff like a lo- uh, elephant electrocution, um, sometimes real, sometimes sort of figment and made up just to kind of give a beautiful spectacle of like electricity flying everywhere with various cables um, and sort of the elephant being there. Um, eventually, we did have some responses to this, right? Because everyone loves, you know, animals. Um, there's a, animal lovers are, you know, throughout modern history. Uh, so we have various sort of, uh, you know, societies of, of anti cruelty formed, etc. But it did not really help the spread of sort of animal shows and zoos and attractions as much because it was just such a big money maker for a lot of these individuals. Um, and of course, we had other various forms of entertainment, singing, uh, dancing clubs, comedy, jazz, eventually started to get formed a little earlier on. Um, And magic shows. Magic was great. Like, you know, with the uh, famous Harry Houdini, for example, right? You can go to a magic show and they could show you all these various magic tricks and you would be wowed and amazed, right? Um, Movie theaters with Nickelodeons. Um, Shout out to anyone who used to watch Nickelodeon. Um, Nickelodeons were nicknamed that because it only cost a nickel, hence in the name, Nickelodeon. Uh, you go to the movie theater, you pay a nickel, and they could run a sort of one-minute uh, clip, right, in sort of black and white, uh, no sound, and they kind of splice it together to make it look a little realistic, etc. Um, and so it was just astounding for people to see because, once again, this is the new age of electricity, the new age of all of this new innovation. And so you've never seen anything like this. You walk into a movie theater and suddenly the lights go, well, number one, there's lights, there's electricity lights. So the lights, boom, go dark. And then you just see this huge projection onto the screen um, in whatever various form um, with, with whatever you know movie they're trying to make in a minute or two. Um, definitely great shows and kind of wooed and wowed people. And of course you had sports, right? Uh, baseball being a big, Uh, sort of fan favorite, a very sort of uh, quintessential American pastime of people playing through. So you had all these various fairs and carnivals um, and rides, um, you know, that people were doing. Um, And, you know, oh, this is an interesting one that I forgot to mention. Um, Something like this uh, with like Buffalo Bills, um, let's say uh, touring group. Uh, where they would also have, you know, where space is available because you need enough space for the horseback rides. But uh, they would have things like Buffalo Bills Wild West shows um, where they were sort of trying to reenact, let's say, uh, various battles between the, you know, uh, the natives and the cavalrymen or whatever else, right? Or sort of cowboys versus Indians kind of um, and have various <clears throat> shows kind of reenacting some of these things. Uh very popular as well because people were so fascinated with the wild west with cowboys with you know the native americans of the um of the tribal plains etc uh and so some of you know, uh, the native american uh let's say more famous uh, riders um would actually find quite a bit of fame um in making these tour groups right and charging hefty lofty tickets for their name and they were just attraction sites um here we have various posters, real posters um, of, uh, let's say, magic shows, right? Um, come see the magic and the wonder, right? And people are like, ooh, mysticism, scary stuff. Um, and so this was just the other, right? And so in the late 1800s at the turn of the century, as all of this technology is being formed, as we have different peoples from across the world finally coming to the U.S., um, also, as you can kind of tell, I suppose, on the left-hand poster and the right-hand side poster, um, you know, sort of Orientalism and uh, Indian and Chinese culture, right, Asiatic culture, really starts to kind of factor in everywhere. Um, and so this mysticism gets created with other cultures, other worlds, right, other things that we don't understand. And so toss that in and mix it with magic and then boom. Boom you have yourself a successful magic show, right? Um, 
great and interesting to see, right? Just kind of fascinating to study this. Um, the Nickelodeon theaters that I was alluding to earlier. Definitely um, old school vibe to it. Looks um, absolutely stunning. Um, this is sort of the beard, the bearded lady thing I was talking about, right? <laughs> so, you know, you would have uh, someone who naturally, for whatever reason, right, like a girl just, you know, maybe uh, testosterone imbalances or whatever, like, you know, boom, she can just grow a beard. So <laughs> they put her in, uh, they put her in these various shows, right, of strange people or freak shows or whatever. Um, so they would have a combination of, let's say, and they have various movies and cartoons about this throughout um, the last like 20, 30 years or also that you can refer to. But, you know, the typical quote unquote freak show, you'll have like a bearded lady, a strong man, you'll have like a super tall, lanky dude, you'll have a, you know, uh, let's say a, a short, uh, a short midget kind of walking through there as well. Uh, you'll have people without limbs. Uh, you'll have people that are insanely flexible and can do gymnastics. You'll have like a strong man that could just lift heavy weights, right? It's like a traveling circus. It's a traveling show. Um, and so, yeah, once again, especially with the day and age of mysticism and trying to rediscover the world and all these interesting innovations and things people are um, seeing in the cities, this is definitely kind of an uh, entertainment factor for them. And of course, baseball, good old baseball, bada, 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 right? Um, with the, oh, dude, look at this, um, the umpire on the left-hand side, just with, with his little um, peacocked pose. Yeah, anyways, yeah, great little pastime. Um, here's a nice conversation about class differentiations. So in the city, how did the different classes act and what do they do? So in the upper class, for instance, uh, mainly revolving themselves around business, financial deals, right? More luxurious means of life, going to classical musical concerts and having fine art collections, darling, right? Social gatherings, uh, going to Carnegie Hall and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? Having your uh, spectacles and being like, aha, have you, have you heard of Wagner recently? Yes, very good. Uh, can I get a spot of tea, right? Very high class, very sort of, like to ele you know elevate themselves above the rest. Then you have your middle class, the uh, working professionals, managers, salesmen, engineers, doctors, etc. Right, professional salaried folk um, moving into this m new sort of middle class, right, affording enough to get themselves into suburbs. Um, and, you know, purchasing nice homes for themselves and build and developing their families, right? Later on, not necessarily at this point in time, we'll get there, but later on, uh, Henry Ford's like automobile also started to tie into itself with the middle class, eventually becoming like this sort of utopian suburban lifestyle, right? That people wanted for, you know, being in the middle class, the American dream, right? Was being born. And at the very bottom, we got the good old working class, Harsh reality, working many hours a day, not having um, those, you know, uh, let's say pr more professionalized middle class or upper class degrees and just putting in the hard work, living in slums, unsanitary conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're, the working class is you're putting in your dues and then hopefully you'll get into the middle class one day. And if you're really lucky and successful, you get into the upper class um, where you can spend all your money on art. So, yeah. Um, part four, uh, changes in writing and thought. And so this one will be a little bit shorter, but a nice, interesting discussion as well. Darwinism. Uh, so the theories of Darwin here are very interesting um, because Darwin um, and his various you know, views um, really starts to um, be known um, throughout the world. Now, Darwin had a very, um, you know, interesting past in history because he was a scientist and he did go to the Galapagos, um, uh, the Galapagos, the, uh, excuse me, the Madagascar Galapagos Islands to sort of start his theory of evolution. Now, um, he did pass away in 82, um, but his um, sort of on origin of species, right, uh, was passed in um what was it, 59, I believe. So a few decades prior to our conversation here at the turn of the century. But 
by the turn of the century, his theories really gained steam, right? It became more and more widely avail available and well known. So, um, Darwinistic uh, initial theories, right? Um, on the basis and face of it, right? The biological theories be, you know, were very good. They were scientific. They were on biology, right? Different uh, species evolved uh, differently depending on those islands that they were, et cetera, et cetera. The problem was that eventually his theories were then converted into social Darwinism because once he was bringing back his views to England, um, the conversations started. Well, if, you know, if uh, animals... Um, evolved from each other um, where did monkeys and all these other things evolve from was it people and if so um, you know does that make us inferior and would there be ca different classifications to human beings then right of us evolving differently because you know the whites look different from the asians right and the asians looks look differently from uh, let's say the natives and the natives look differently from the blacks and so you know how do we all factor in and then if we all potentially uh, evolved differently on a species level like now is there a hierarchy or category that we can place on this so it really kind of spun out of control and so although darwin's uh, on the origin of species was his original biological you know um, theory the social socialists not socialists that's the wrong word to use the um the sort of the people in charge i suppose to a certain extent were trying to use that and they converted it into social darwinism to the point where social darwinism then became even larger than darwinism itself as a concept around the world and so social darwinism you could use that for two ways either racially to say that x y and z racial group is better and well more suited for everything versus this X, Y, and Z inferior group based off of typically skin color, um, uh, origin of birth, etc. cetera. Um, what it also could mean at the turn of the century, because now we're getting into conversations, especially with urbanization, uh, upper middle class, working class, right? And this sort of uh, different, uh, uh, different categorizations of wealth, right? And how people are living and how that's uh, affecting your lifestyle. Um, the wealth gap, right, can also be supposedly discussed in terms of social Darwinism, saying that, well, some people are just better suited and they've evolved uh, differently to grow into a hardworking individual who deserves all of their wealth. And some people evolved into the lazy, um, you know, SOB who's going to die in the gutter drunk. And so suppose there is a certain amount of truth in that, right, a little bit, because to a certain extent, you know, your life is in your hands. So if I want to work 60 hours a week and be the best version of myself possible, by God, I'm going to do it. Right now, if I want to go downstairs and get absolutely plastered with alcohol and do that for the next 20 years of my life before I die at an early age in the gutter of the street, I can do that too. So it's all in your hands. Um, but the social Darwinistic part really kind of also pushed heavily on that racialized theory hierarchy part, which has obviously been debunked. So mixed, mixed thoughts here. Literary works. Um, speaking close to home, I suppose, with the Darwinistic conversation, uh, different authors and writers, um, and I'll focus more on The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Um, he started to really embrace, uh, you know, various things such as naturalism, um, stating that, uh, you know, similar to, I guess, Darwin's work and other works that they were reading for, from uh, scientists and sociologists, that naturalism was a pure natural law. You cannot escape natural law, right? Physics, the universe, etc. And that that is the only true relevant law that governs life, that governs humanity. And if you think about this, I suppose that's more of, of a philosophical question. Um, perhaps, yes, he is correct, because out of everything else in life that we have, whether societally embraced or laws or anything else, at the end of the day, nature, you know, finds a way. Nature is uh, unyielding, right? We're all going to die one day. We all age. Um, you know, natural laws of the world sort of do dictate um, everything. 
Uh, and so this kind of deals with some of you know the modern conversations and, and sort of increases in um, the progression of science, but also in relation to the increase of um, philosophy uh, philosophical conversations, scientific conversations with Darwin and all of his um, sort of viewpoints there. Uh, and so, yeah, it definitely started to progress into um, literary works as well. Uh, and, you know, Mark Twain is another famous example uh, because he was also kind of focusing on discussing in relative uh, ways in his novels about, let's say, issues of corruption, right, in the Gilded Age. Uh, and wealth and equality. So these literary um, writers, right, these novelists were beautifully utilizing everything that's going on in the world around them at that time and extrapolating that into their text, which I found great. Um, and a feminist perspective also, this is very interesting because now as we have the turn of the century, Kate Chopin, a great short story writer, so read some of her work, it is fantastic. Um, she portrays a very realistic view of potentially how a lot of women viewed their lives at the turn of the century because um, now, and I suppose now we're going through another round of it 100 years later, currently, in another form or fashion, but that's another conversation. Um, as society is now changing and progressing and modernizing, um, and women are starting to get uh, more leisurely time, right? You are not on the farm doing household chores and raising all these kids and this and this, like now people are living in the cities more. Um, if you are middle class or higher, um, women have a little more luxury time, right? Leisure time, etc. So um, they start th thinking to themselves, like, is, you know, is motherhood and wifehood the only thing that I'm here for, right? Uh, and so starting to kind of question that. And so this is, she is perhaps, I don't know if she's officially labeled as this, but I know that the conversation is there. She's perhaps, you know, one of the earliest feminist perspective writers or these public figures um, detailing, let's say, the female struggle in America during this time, stemming from a lot of her own experiences with her past um, husband and marriages and others. Um, and so some of her uh, short stories detail, let's say, the in, uh, internal struggle of a woman sort of fighting and battling societal uh, constrictions saying that you must be a wife, you must be a mother, you must do be dutiful, etc. Versus, let's say, some of her other ambitions, you know, maybe I want to be a business owner, maybe I want to go to school, right? Um, write a couple books, travel, whatever, right? Um, and so, yeah, she definitely details and gives a very good uh, viewpoint into this turn of the century for, uh, you know, women. And so definitely uh, check out some of her work. And it's a great conversation to have as urbanization increases. Um, it definitely influences all factors and walks of life, no matter who it is. And I thought this meme was just glorious. Come on. Um, from Ron Swanson for Parks and Recreation. I got my first job when I was nine, worked at a sheet uh, metal factory. In two weeks, I was running the floor. Child labor laws ruin this country. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's just, I mean, that's just golden right there. I mean, you can't, you can't really beat that. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. Anyways, folks, um, I want to just thank you um, for being here for chapter 19 for the lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I will see you next time for chapter 20. Take care.